Hey, gang, this week's episode is brought to you by BetDSI. Hey, you looking for a place to bet on NFL and NCAA football? BetDSI is the industry leader in football betting and the perfect sports book for both novice and professional bettors alike. New members get a 100% bonus match when you use the promo code SEATS100. Yeah, that's SEATS100 at BetDSI.com. That's more than double your money to help start winning today. Once again, BetDSI.com, promo code SEATS100, and get your limited time 100% bonus offer when you deposit today. Now, here's our show. The legacy of the NASL is called S-O-C-C-E-R. It's a cliche. It's true. It's, uh, these were truly the... Uh, the soccer uh, pioneers in this country. If there was no NASL, there wouldn't be in any professional league in the United States right now. The play got here. This game exploded in this country. He helped bring Giorgio Kinali. He helped bring Cruyff. He helped bring Georgie Bassi. Unbelievably. Ben still has it. I don't believe this move. He's oh! It was probably the most thrilling time in American soccer. I couldn't take my eyes off the game. I couldn't take my eyes off the players. I loved it. And you can make the parallels to me in other sports where the Yankees of the 70s, good or bad for baseball because they were the best team, right? So were the, were the Cosmos with Pelé, Beckenbauer, Canalia, Etc. Were they bad for the sport or good for the sport? Everything was about being the biggest and being the best. It was kind of the perfect storm. And the money and the ego was was insane. Studio 54, Henry Kissinger, you know, Mick Jagger, they're in hanging out with you. This was a league that was hip, a league that was <laughs> for three or four years the biggest thing in a particular city. It was the best of times. It was the best for all of us. Um, the damnedest thing about it is that it didn't last long enough. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Well, all right, all right, all right. How are you doing, everybody? My name is Tim Hanlon, if you didn't know that by now. And if you didn't know that you're in the right place, hopefully, it's good seats still available. Yes, it is the Curious Little Podcast. Very curious, extremely curious, perhaps too much so, uh, that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. It's our little genre of intrigue uh, that we like to uh, keep knocking on each and every week, uh, uh, despite all the obstacles against it. And uh, we thank you for uh, finding us uh, and downloading us and putting us in your earbuds. Uh, hopefully some fun and excitement for you this week. We go back, as you can tell by that clip, into arguably the thing that kind of got me going on this little jag of almost five years now. It's the North American Soccer League. Yes, and finally, my goodness, finally, a feature-length documentary devoted to this uh, this thing, this uh, curiosity, this uh, white-hot comet, if you will, of soccer goodness that uh, existed in the United States and uh, Canada, otherwise known as North America, for from uh, the tributaries, right, from 1967 all the way through uh, a whimpering end in 1984 after that season. And um, uh, the North American Soccer League was uh, an enigma. It was uh, fascinating. It was um, the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, just so many different sort of things wrapped up in it. Of course, you know about the Cosmos. Uh, you certainly remember certainly some of the, the teams and the, the various personalities, the Rowdies and the, the Strikers and the Vancouver Whitecaps and the Seattle Sounders and the 
the earthquakes of San Jose and, you know, those those names that live on today in the Cascadia, the uh, Cascadia uh, region there, the Portland Timbers, et cetera. Uh, those memories are, are very, very long and lasting. And uh, we are honored to have uh, the filmmaker behind the brand new spanking brand new documentary called Big Time Soccer, The Remarkable Rise and Fall of the NASL. Her name is Rachel Violet. And if that last name is uh, familiar to you, well, perhaps, especially if you're a soccer fan, you will know who her famous father was. Dennis Violet, who was a, a legend uh, in uh, at Manchester United for many, many years, a gold scoring machine, a survivor of the tragic uh, Munich air disaster, uh, uh, playing with the Busby Babes of the 50s, um, uh, a little bit at Stoke City, and then coming over to the United States, uh, coming out of retirement, actually, playing for the pre-NASL, then NPSL tributary, known as the uh, Boston, excuse me, Boston, Baltimore Bays, uh, the champions of that six, uh, that uh, original or originator league as a player and came back a number of years later to be a, a longtime coach. Uh, the Washington Diplomats, the New England T-Men, the Jacksonville T-Men. And it's around those years that uh, that Rachel uh, was growing up and uh, was uh, perhaps, uh, 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 at least for jealous for me, uh, being able to kind of just run around like literally on the sidelines and be on the bench during games and stuff. And she didn't know know any better, frankly, just to hang around and, and watch the uh, watch the players and and kind of, if you will, grow up in in this uh, this this seemingly foreign sport of soccer, uh, trying to transplant itself into the uh, United States sports vernacular. And uh, it, this uh, this film is is uh, long overdue. And as you could probably tell, perhaps if you're a soccer aficionado, you probably recognize some of those voices that you heard in that opening clip, that, uh, that trailer. Uh, and some of them, by the way, are um, former guests of ours. Uh, Clive Toy is in there. Al Miller's in there. Um, uh, but folks like Kyle Roach Jr. are, are in this movie. Um, Werner Roth is in this movie. Our, our old pal uh, Bobby Smith uh, is interviewed in this. Um, uh, and just on and on and on, some great uh, names of the past uh, and still present, frankly, who were part of this arguably magical time known as the North American Soccer League. We've, we've talked about it on a number of different episodes, either with first person folk who were there and part of the mix, uh, others who have either done books or, or uh, uh, tertiary uh, sort of recollections of such. But uh, thank goodness, finally, uh, Rachel has uh, uh, put all the pieces together to create uh, this uh, uh, highly anticipated documentary. And depending on when you're listening to this show, um, we're dropping this, I think, on October the 11th. And um, uh, if you are listening to this uh, in real time or pretty close to real time, you still may have a chance to see this at its ostensibly world premiere. Now, it, just, it premiered, fair disclosure, it did premiere at the National Soccer Hall of Fame about a week or two ago, I was sort of part of a private uh, sort of celebratory event uh, around uh, uh, Hall of Fame activities. But the uh, sort of, I guess, official world debut uh, will be happening in New York on Wednesday, October the 13th. That's two days from when we drop this episode as part of the Kicking and Screening Festival in New York City uh, on Wednesday, October the 13th at 7 p.m., at a place called Upper 90 in uh, Astoria, Queens. And uh, if you go to kickingandscreening.com, screening as in, as in movie screening, kickingandscreening.com, uh, you can find out all the information and see if there's any way you can somehow buy a ticket and sneak yourself into the, the debut. And I know uh, that Rachel uh, will be joined by uh, a number of uh, members of the soccer community uh, and, a, and more than a few uh, were, who were interviewed for this film. Uh, and I think there'll be a little discussion after it as well. But look, this is a story about a, um, a league that, uh, you know, a little bit more than 40 years ago now um, left its mark and continues, frankly, to leave its mark, which is sort of the theme of the film. Uh, and we've again, we've discussed this with some of our, our friends 
uh, about this, uh, uh, the impact of this league, uh, it, it, uh, it, it really still has reverberations that last all the way through MLS and, uh, just the plethora of, of, of soccer in this country that we're able to, uh, to enjoy on television from all over the planet now. And arguably the, um, uh, a lot of the, uh, the stability and the intrigue and the interest and the widening interest still of the sport of soccer, uh, can be attributed to, uh, the roots uh, laid by this crazy thing known as the NASL. And that's our conversation this week with the, uh, or tour, if you will, the creator of this documentary, uh, again, it's called Big Time Soccer, and our guest is Rachel Violet, and we will get to that conversation in just a few moments' time. This is uh, intriguing stuff, some fun little uh, uh, curiosities about the making of the film, a little bit about uh, being the daughter of a famous uh, soccer player who uh, kind of chucked it all and moved to the United States and helped build and, and root uh, this sport, and I think you're going to enjoy it tremendously, and it's coming up in a moment, and maybe a moment and a half's time. Uh, before we get there, let's talk about our sponsor of the week. And of course, we always try to keep it thematically uh, related to the proceedings uh, for our conversations. And this week, there's no better uh, touting of uh, of said sponsor this week than Streaker Sports. StreakerSports.com, the purveyors of sports culture. You know them, you love them, you can't live without them. They've got all kinds of great stuff around teams and leagues no longer with us, clearly something we love, but also to things uh, related to sports, sports culture, truly, like the Onions Collection, uh, featuring the uh, great signature phrase of one Bill Raftery uh, of college basketball fame. Uh, if you're a big fan of Wiffle Ball or the movie Slapshot, uh, perhaps uh, the movie uh, and the uh, the memories around Miracle on Ice of the 1980. Uh, Olympic hockey team. How about Caddyshack? Maybe you were a fan of that. All those things uh, can be found in great t-shirt and other forms at streakersports.com. But again, we obsess mostly about the defunct leagues sections. And I, and I say sections heartily plural. Um, we're talking about things from the ABA and the major indoor lacrosse league and roller hockey international and the USFL and on and on and on. It is a treasure trove of finely crafted shirts with great logos and secondary logos and tertiary logos, and no better expression of that than, of course, the North American Soccer League collection. Just go to streakersports.com, go under the defunct leagues section, and why don't you dial up the North American Soccer League uh, set of pages, and my, oh my, will you find just fantastic shirts, great colors, uh, wonderful uh, uh, logos, and uh, on, in, in certain instances, you'll see not just sort of the logos that you think you know and remember, but you'll see some alternate takes as well, perhaps things that you never thought. Like there are a couple of examples of Tulsa Roughnecks logos in there. There are a couple of Earthquakes one. There's the 1973 looking one, and there's one from, I think, in later years as well. Um, there are a couple of Rochester Lancers um, uh, looks. There's even uh, one that I'd never seen before until I uh, went to look uh, to check up and see what's going on on this site. Uh, there's, a, there's an alternate Calgary Boomers logo. It's sort of this scripted letter B, uh, you know, a uh, big uh, uppercase letter B uh, with a with an NASL stars and stripes uh, or stars and uh, stars on the ball logo in the middle of that B. I've never seen that before on anything. Um, but it's great. It's, this is uh, these are shirts that are, are sure to please, and uh, in many cases, sure to surprise even the most uh, uh, diehard of NASL aficionados and fan fans uh, with uh, perhaps some of these uh, alternate logos that uh, haven't been seen as much, or frankly, in certain circles, never uh, seen at all uh, by uh, most human eyes. But this is this is the kind of great stuff you're going to find at streakersports.com, and of course. Once you find the stuff that you're looking for, how about that Las Vegas Quicksilvers t-shirt? It only lasted one season, but what better way to show your fandom of the NASL than celebrating one of the teams that only lasted one year? Boy, oh boy. Or maybe the Montreal Olympique, remember them? Or the 1967 Pittsburgh Phantoms, the Baltimore Bays, the Atlanta Apollos. It goes on and on and on. Use the promo code while you're there at streakersports.com. Promo code is good seats. Again, yeah, it's the promo code, good seats, 
and you're going to get 15% off all of your purchases when you go early and often to streakersports.com. Thank you, Streaker Sports, for your sponsorship of the show. Please enjoy those T-shirts and that uh, the memories of the NASL. And uh, after you've uh, purchased those shirts, why don't you put down your pen and paper and your credit card and sit back and enjoy and listen to our fun interview with Rachel Violet as we talk about the North American Soccer League and her cool film coming out very soon. It's called Big Time Soccer, The Remarkable Rise of, and Fall of the NASL. Here's our conversation we had just a few days ago. We had to rush it out and get it to you. So please sit back and enjoy. Let's start from the start here. I, I'm Before we get into the meat of this uh, of the film and, and the topic and all that kind of stuff, um, I'm fascinated by you as an individual and you're uh, as a person, right? Um, you come at this from a personal, uh, somewhat vested interest. Maybe you could regale our audience with a little bit of your background, who your famous father was, uh, and maybe, right. frankly, even uh, what I didn't even know until very recently, until I started doing some crack research, uh, your professional sports career, not in the sport of soccer. Right, right. Uh Correct. My first love was soccer. Um, and my, uh, I, I'm going to talk about my dad first because he was, uh, my hero and I know a hero for a lot of people. He, he played for Manchester United, um, during the fifties and sixties and was part of the Busby Bay team who were uh, coached by Sir Matt Busby. And, uh, the reason for that nickname is, uh, the average age of the team was only 22, and they were on the verge of, of conquering not only really English soccer, but world soccer. And then they were involved in a plane crash. Uh, my dad survived, uh, but st still went on to have a, a pretty amazing career with the club and, and is, uh, currently is the fifth all-time goal scorer and still holds the, the uh, league goal scoring record, 32 goals in 36 games, which Ronaldo almost broke. He scored 31. I believe it was, was it 10? 10 years ago now, a little, no, more than 10 years ago. He was at Real Madrid, Real Madrid 10 years ago. Must have been about 15 years ago. And um, so, yeah, that's his, uh, his background. And then he, uh, he came to America uh, in the late 60s as a, as a player, believe it or not. But he toured the United States with Manchester United in the 50s and pretty much fell in love with the country. So when the opportunity came up in the late 60s to come over as a player first, he jumped at it and uh, played for the Baltimore Bays, scored the, the first goal in a, uh, uh, the, a live uh, nationally broadcast uh, professional soccer game final, and then went back to England for a short period and then came back again and coached in the NASL for 10 years. Uh, and that's where I, I fell in love with the NASL. Uh, those were, you and I were just talking about that. They were amazing times for so many people, so many people of our generation, kids of my, that were around at that time. Uh, they were our heroes and, uh, they were just the best times. I don't think, I don't think there's been a time in my life where maybe a week hasn't gone by that I haven't thought about those times, uh, in the NASL. They were great, great years. Well, let, let's put it also in context. Uh, you're you you came onto the scene literally, you know, uh, coming into this uh, onto this uh, this earth uh, in the in the early '70s. And what was your? And this was in the United States when uh, when Dennis had had moved and and uh, to the states and, and started managing in this thing called the North American Soccer League. So, without sort of <laughs> revealing any gory details about sort of you know age and all that kind of stuff what, what was your what was your first uh, uh memory or awareness i guess of i guess soccer and or this red white and blue ball thing and and this nas you certainly learned about as you got older yeah i like i said i i wasn't around uh when my dad was playing for manchester united i was born in 72 and in manchester uh and then my parents came to america when i was two my earliest recollection i have very very early memories of watching games at rfk stadium when my dad coached the diplomats but uh probably my fondest memories were in in foxborough massachusetts when he coached the new england team men of the nasl with noel cantwell who was an, also an ex-manchester united player and then the team moved to jacksonville 
of all places, uh, and became the Jacksonville team. And so those were my first real memories because I used to go to the games with my dad. I used to tag along with him. Uh, he, he used to let me, and this was actually, I only found out recently quite common. I mean, I sat on the bench, right? I was like a, a little kid and I, and he used to let me sit on the bench, but apparently a lot of kids, uh, used to do that, you know, kids of, of coaches and players, they used to sit on the bench and it was sort of informal like that. And I'd stand behind the goal and watch the game and, you know, chase down balls for the players and, it was such an amazing time. And the, and the players and the staff were so personable with all the fans and the kids and because their mission was to grow the game uh, and to get the American sports fan into soccer. So it was uh, it was an incredible time. We, we have talked about that, that aspect with just about every former player and almost to a person. I mean, Kyle wrote in particular. Um, uh, Paul Child in particular, uh, Dennis Moff, uh, Dennis Moffat, Bobby Moffat, um, uh, the they all uh, had amazing stories of just sort of humble grassroots outreach, you know, either through the front office's efforts or frankly, their own efforts. And maybe even in certain cases, even to support or supplement their incomes because they weren't making a lot of dough, but they wanted to stay involved with the game. And it was the most natural thing for them to do to not only make some extra dough, but maybe also help grow the game uh, through coaching or, or other activities that might get people to come to the games once the season rolled around again. Right. Right. And, and one of the, one of the other things uh, that I forgot to mention were the after parties. I don't know if you, if you remember this at all, or if the Cosmos did it, but I know a lot of teams did. And certainly my dad's teams, we would, after the games, we would go to a local restaurant and there would be free food, put on by the club the fans would go the players would go and we we would literally have be having not me at the time because i was a kid but the fans and and you know the players they'd be drinking together i mean and having a great time after the game i mean can you imagine that today um but yeah and the grassroots thing was was huge uh the, the camps the clinics that they put on and a lot of times they didn't get paid for it. Uh, it was stuff they did through the club and spent many, many hours doing that. In fact, we, we talk about that in, in my upcoming documentary about the NASL and how coaches like Ron Newman uh, would literally see a bunch of kids playing at a local park and pull out some cones from his car and go over and, and do a, a quick uh, coaching session with them. So things like that happen uh, quite frequently and just incredible what, what they did to uh, grow the game. I, I think Florida teams uh, kind of had a lock on, on sort of that uh, uh, after game sort of fan mingle party <laughs> thing. I mean, I, I, I just, all I know the is. The Rowdies did it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, th I think so. I, I'm sure it was, it was popular in other places too. I'm sure Memphis and, and, and Tulsa and all that kind of stuff. But I, in New York, it was a little different, right? Because as we'll get into, right, you know, the Cosmos were figuratively and, and literally sort of in their own orbit, right? And they had their sort of stadium club experience at Giant Stadium, and it was, you know, the biggest stadium in that, a big, and the celebrities and the Warhols and the Mick Jagger, you know. So I that that unfortunately was lost on me and my sort of experience, I, although I guess we made it up in, in championship teams, but I digress. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but okay, so so tell me then. All right, but the the whole exposure to soccer thing and and, and being on, near the clubs and, and and being on the bench and stuff um, that didn't rub off onto you professionally though. You you went in another sports direction, didn't you? I did. I, I did play soccer until I was about fifteen, and then I was uh, and, and tennis. I was playing both. Yeah, uh, don't, so don't be 15. modest about the tennis because uh, from what you did, <laughs> you're pretty darn good. Yeah. And I, I was starting to get injured, uh, quite a bit. Uh, just, I was overdoing it, I guess you could say. So I just, I got to a crossroads and had to choose. And I think at that time it was the mid eighties probably saw more, uh, opportunity, I guess, in, in women's tennis than soccer at the time. And, and I chose tennis, uh, which I think served me quite well and played at the university of Miami for four years. And got to play professionally uh, at the Grand Slams and for my country. So, so no regrets with that. Uh, but soccer was my first love, I have to be honest. And I'm still, as you can tell, just through the films that, that I'm making and I'm working on another one right now, uh, it's still a huge passion of mine and always will be. So, 
yeah, I hope to make a lot more soccer movies. Okay, so tell me then the path to uh, making not only this movie, but the uh, your your documentary about your dad in 2016, um, and, and and sort of that path. Like, how did you give me a sense of of, of how one in particular you becomes a documentarian because it's not for the faint of heart and it's certainly not for the big bucks. Right. Right. I mean, documentaries are uh, a labor of love. uh, And I have always loved docs. Uh, There's there's such uh, nothing comes across better in a story than if it's done well in a, in a documentary. And I got the idea of doing my dad's film quite a number of years ago and then I, I moved out to L.A. about nine years ago now, I think. And um, I met my uh, my partner, one of my one of my uh, producing partners on that film, Greg Wonder. And I met him. I think I'd been out here about a year and uh, he was looking to do a documentary. And I said, well, do you want to team up and we can do one about my dad because I'm ready to do this. I want to do it. So he uh, agreed and I just started to get it organized and uh, called Manchester United. I think I emailed and got some interviews lined up in the UK, but it was a challenging, it was a challenging uh, documentary because there was almost two stories. There was his English uh, career life. And then part two was America. So uh, I had to do a bunch of (laughs) interviews here too. So it was almost, I almost felt like I was doing two movies at the time, but I, w- I was ready to do it. I mean, my dad passing away in 99, it was uh, hard to get over. And uh, so this was almost therapeutic for me to do the film, and I was ready to do it. So, How did you, uh, when you entered into that process and then sort of realized you had this sort of second parallel story, I guess, or second part of the story with the United States exposure, I mean, how much of this did you know kind of going in um, because obviously it, what it what it would have done is is forced you to not only go back to uh, your your dad's uh, United career and, and, and Stoke City and that, but also, frankly, revisiting some of the years that you just were you were around but not conscious of really, and, and frankly, even the Baltimore Bays in the North NBSL uh, even before you were born. Um, how much of all of that backstory did you know, or was this? These journeys of these two documentaries, the current one and, and, and the previous one, how much of them was how much was this sort of revealing itself to you? I mean, I, I got to think there were some new things that you found out along the way. Right. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, the, start with the NASL doc. Yes, I had experienced a lot of it and spent a lot of time, but I was young. Right. So your perspective is is different. Um, it was still wonderful. But as I got older and it was actually while I was filming my dad's doc that I talked to, I interviewed a lot of former NASL players and some coaches and that I, I started to hear different stories and, and see a different side to things. And um, I, that's probably when it really came together in my mind to do a, a documentary about the NASL is when I was uh, uh, shooting my dad's film. So, but with my dad, I think what was really great for me because I I wasn't around when he played for United was to go back or Stoke City was to go back to England and talk to the guys that he played with, uh, that uh, fans that saw him play and kind of in a way get to learn about his life back then because I I didn't know anything really about it other than he was this sort of goal scoring legend. So it was amazing to go back and kind of um, almost relive those times through all of his, his, you know, friends and, and ex teammates and family and all of that. So that was, that was really amazing for me. And what I took away with that, which I didn't know was how much they all thought of him as a, a team player. And uh, not just the goal scorer, but that he was a really great team player uh, and um, sometimes naughty. You know, one of the interesting stories that came up was he used to hate running long distance. And I found out that when they would do a long distance run, when Sir Matt Busby would make him go run, um, my dad would sometimes get a ride with the milkman to, you know, cut out some of the course so he wouldn't finish the whole run. 
So things like that I learned, and uh, oh, but it was it was amazing. No wonder he was the freshest guy on the pitch then during the games. <laughs> Right. Let me let me ask yeah. you during that process then, and and I'm I'm curious when the NASL sort of got uh, discussed uh, on the other side of the pond with those players. I, you know, as you certainly uh, allude to in the film, and and you you were uh, we we all sort of know now the the uh, uh, the English uh, transfer, if you will, the players uh, of the from the English game were were uh, a solid part of the NASL. I mean, the NASL was very. Yeah very summer-like. It was almost maybe four months in length. I mean, it was almost, it, it was neatly sandwiched in between sort of a lot of the European leagues and stuff. But England, I think, probably had the most amount of of players that came over either partially or uh, fully to play in the NASL. I'm wondering those memories uh, in this, in the in your interview process, um, I, we, I, I seem to remember and hear uh, reminiscences of the NASL was sort of very bright and shiny and like uh, uh, novel given uh, its uh, juxtaposition with the English game, which seemed to be around that time much more uh, dour and and, and, and yes. defensive and, and, and less than sparkling, shall we say. I Absolutely. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. A lot of the players talked about that. And I know my, my parents talked about that. It was like coming to America was on so many levels was just such a, an eye opening experience. I mean, everything about it, the, the culture um, was new, uh, the game. I mean, Ray Hudson had some hysterical stories about coming over, you know, he had played for Newcastle and coming over and playing for the signing for the Fort Lauderdale strikers. And the sun is out every day. I mean, that was a novelty. The cheerleaders on the sideline, he couldn't quite wrap his head around that. Um, you know, the, the mascots running around, you know, throwing the ball. I mean, he just, there were just things that they were fascinated by. Uh, I remember my mother talked about when she came with my dad, simple things like having a garbage disposal. They didn't have garbage disposals in, in the UK at that time, things like that. Uh, my dad couldn't get over the fact that every morning he woke up and the sun was out, right? Cause he came, he came from Manchester. So yeah, there was a lot, of, a lot of that, and they were all fascinated and just, yeah, with, with coming to America. Do you think any of them kind of wondered, like, what the hell they got themselves into? I mean, given the, the crowds, uh, yeah, and certainly certain markets were, were, were tremendous, but not, not, not so much in others. Uh, there was an anonymity, frankly. I think George Best, when he came over, he actually liked the fact that most people had no idea who he was. But I got to think if you're a star player in, in England— uh, you kind of maybe miss a little of the adulation or, or maybe most of the players didn't miss it. I don't know. Yeah, that that's an interesting one. I, I think um, I think some of them had a tough time with that, maybe just playing in front of, you know, a few thousand fans. Uh, but that wasn't something that came up a lot, I found in in the interviews that I did. I don't remember or recall a lot of players uh, talking about the – the lack of fans thereof, but I, I'm sure that that had an impact on, on some of them. I do remember uh, guys like Rodney talking about going to certain stadiums like Lockhart stadium in Fort Lauderdale where the strikers played and, and they liked that kind of intimate feel in uh, with some of the stadiums as well. So that was interesting. The NASL story, how do you approach it? Uh, do you do it linear? And I don't, you don't have to give away the film. Obviously, we're going to be you know, promoting the heck out of it and stuff and uh, as, as part of this. But uh, is this – this is more of a, a form and a, a process question. How do, you, how do you approach it? Do you, do you do it completely in a linear fashion and start at the, the beginnings of, of the diaspora of, of 1966 and, the, and the, the two leagues or three leagues trying to scramble to – get a pro league going in the United States, or do you start elsewhere? I mean, wh wh what's your entry? Well, I can't, I can't give that much information okay. away. Well, <laughs> that, fair enough. But I mean, how do you, wh what's going through your mind is the, the best way to possibly tell this story? I guess that's a better question. Right. Right. To, to keep it, uh, to keep it tight because there's so many ways that this story could have got lost being told. There were so many things that happened. And I think what I, what I loved or what I found fascinating was there really were almost two, two parts of the story. There was the pre-Pele years, and then there was the, the Pele years. 
So it was, it was making those two segments work, um, making it flow, which is, which, like I said, which isn't easy, but it's just to keep the story driving forward um, and to find that one common or that one storyline that drives a film forward and stay on that. Don't deviate too much, which was obviously a challenge with, with this movie. Uh, but I think we were, we were able to do that. One of the things, well, I, I can't say that I, I'm going to not go there, but um, yeah, so that, that's always, that's always the challenge with, with a documentary is keeping the story uh, moving forward and keeping it tight. Right. So you don't you don't go off on too many, too many tangents. How about the source material? Um, You're talking to somebody and we've talked to plenty of people. You know, there there is uh, there is depending on your perspective, there's either an abundance of these uh, old tapes that, you know, are are just were magically saved and uploaded to YouTube and that kind of stuff, you know, NASL coverage and and bits and pieces. But then, of course, just glaring omissions. I mean, you even hinted at it at the beginning, right? There's the Baltimore Bay's NPSL or NASL championship match or whatever. The, these were games that were on the CBS television network that nobody seems to know where they are. Even the games, there were even some of these international soccer matches that uh, that when Dennis came over with the uh, Manchester United, they were broadcast apparently locally on, on Channel 11, WPIX in New York. Nobody seems to know where those are either. Um how, re- how readily available and or frustratingly uh, uh, challenging was it to find the video that you wanted to tell the story best? Right. It, it, was, cha- it was challenging. Luckily, I actually love doing archival research. I, I love looking for that stuff. And uh, through, some, uh, through some guys that, were, that worked in the NESL, um, and also through some of my parents' very good friends who worked in the front office of different clubs in the NASL, because people moved around a lot because the clubs, the clubs, there was, there were some that were very, that were stable and that were around for a number of years. But then, as you know, a lot of clubs just came and went, you know, they were there for a year or two and then folded. So there was, there was a lot of movement. People moved around, whether it be players, coaches, front office. So, I was able to actually get my hands on some tapes uh, from these individuals, which was a a godsend for me. And um, so, yeah. And then uh, photos, I got some amazing photos from some of the photographers that were around at that time. Uh, And so that it all came together, but I I had to contact a lot of people uh, and I, I was, lucky enough to uh to to find some some tapes that were just buried in uh garages and and that sort of thing so and then there was a few local networks because you have to remember that the 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 local networks um uh shot a lot of footage so i was able to get some from from some of the local affiliates as well which was great but the footage from the 70s is can be a little bit grainy so um that was always that, that that's tricky to deal with sometimes all right what's this bet dsi all right well hey you're looking for a place to bet on nfl and, and ncaa football well, bet dsi is an industry leader perhaps even the industry leader in football betting and is the perfect sports book for both novice and professional bettors alike. At BetDSI, you can also enjoy live in-game betting. So what's that mean? Well, that means you can not only bet your favorite teams, but you can do uh, that and all kinds of different prop bets and, and various situations all game long on nearly every play to the final whistle. BetDSI has been around for 20 years and paying winners all along the way. 10,000 and more betting options daily on all the sports you love to watch. Uh, daily fantasy, uh, top ratings on all the betting review sites, you name it, BetDSI uh, uh, is the way to go. They've got a very user-friendly interface and mobile site and has the fastest payouts in the industry. Simply play, you win, and you get paid. Doesn't get better than that. Plus, BetDSI offers betting options for just about everything. NFL, college football, sure, but NBA, NHL, UFC, golf, other sports, politics even, reality TV, esports, virtually everything. 
Try live betting at BetDSI and you can bet on every major sport and event through the entire game, every play and every minute. So new members, that's what you're here for, right? New members get a 100% bonus match to their deposit when you use the promo code SEATS100. Again, 100% a bonus match when you use promo code SEATS100. That's more than double your money to start winning today. So once again, go to betdsi.com and use the promo code SEATS100 and get this limited time 100% bonus offer and make some extra cash on the sports you know and love. And additionally, if you use Bitcoin, you'll get an additional 100% deposit bonus on your first two deposits up to $2,000. It all adds up to BetDSI being the place to do your betting as the football season approaches. It's only a game until you bet it at BetDSI. Thank you, BetDSI, for your sponsorship of this episode. And now... Back to our conversation. I got to think that um, uh, the memories uh, of the people that you interviewed were both um, uh, nostalgically uh, gauzy and uh, and positive, but perhaps also uh, laden with some uh, wistfulness, uh, too, I'm guessing, right? Uh teams going belly up and and that kind of stuff I, i'm curious as to sort of the, the the demeanor of the the first person interviews that you did with people who were there or remember uh elements of being there um would you say it was mostly though uh, happily nostalgic or were there some real sort of negative uh pieces to to, to those memories you know honestly uh th- what i found amazing about this was Almost everyone I talked to, whether it was Ray Hudson or Rodney Marsh or Clive Toy or or uh, Al Miller, everyone says it was the best time of their lives, and that was just a common a common theme throughout the movie. Yeah, it was difficult. There were there were hard times, uh, very difficult times. The the, the league almost uh, went under completely in the early early seventies, late sixties, early seventies. Um, and it was challenging, but everyone I interviewed said it was, it was the best time of my life. The most exciting time in us soccer history, the golden era of soccer. Um, those Pele years, Beckenbauer and Carlos Alberto. I mean, just, yeah. So I, I honestly can't, cannot say there was any negative, negative, uh, energy at all with these interviews. Why do you think that is? Because of their because of their relative age at the time? Because they were it was so unknown. They knew what they were coming from, and it wasn't nearly as exciting as this. Uh, completely uncharted territory, or uh, you know. I think so. Yeah, I think so. And and they were so appreciated here as well. Uh, the fans loved them. Um, it there was a, a a care, even though they were serious about what they were doing. There was this kind of carefree. Uh, fly by the seat of your pants demeanor about the league. It was new. It was exciting. Um, they enjoyed themselves on and off the field. So I think there, were, there was a, a lot of things, but they being in America for these four, especially for the foreign guys, for the, for the Americans, the young Americans that I talked to, or not young now, but were at the time uh, playing with and against these world stars. I mean, they, they, they couldn't have ever imagined that in their lifetime. So it, yeah, it was uh, just new on so many levels for, for everyone. Very exciting. All right. As, as you put this documentary together, um, I'm, you know, I'm sure you are aware of the um, once in a lifetime documentary about the cosmos back in 06, right? How do you, um, and, and using Pele, right. As a sort of a line of demarcation, which, which is, uh, natural and 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 makes a ton of sense. How do you prevent yourself from making the cosmos, which for better or for worse, were a gigantic part of the story? How do you how do you steer away from sort of paralleling that kind of story and or yet keeping them sort of in the mix as well without sort of going too far, right? Because argu- arguably, you know, the league was much more than just the cosmos, but a lot of the I don't know. I think a lot of the the discussion and the and the the uh, the 
the memories and the, and the whatever media there is out there around this tends to always center around this glamour club as kind of like the end all and be all. And, and it certainly wasn't that. Right. And I, I think there's been some things having talked to some of the, the, the players that were around at that time that played for the Cosmos against the Cosmos. I think there were some things that were slightly, slightly exaggerated as well. Um, uh, you know, this, this notion that they were always out, you know, partying all the time at studio 54. I mean, yeah. Did they go to studio 54? Absolutely. But they weren't, it, it wasn't something they were doing like all the time, right. At, at studio 54, things like that. But, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, Mick the Jacker Cosmos, wasn't going to every game. Henry Kissinger wasn't always in the stands. Right, every game, right you know, so. Exactly, exactly. It, it was something, um, they were with Atlantic Records, and it was it was for PR purposes, but it wasn't all the time, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so that that was interesting to, to, to hear that. Uh, I interviewed Werner Roth, and we, we talked about that quite a bit as well. But I will say that... Um, yeah, the Cosmos were the team. I mean, there's no question about it. They were the team and they were at certain points, especially um, sort of the second part of this film, they, they were an anchor. They, they were an important part of the story. They, they anchored the story. And then, um, you know, you, you, you go off and you talk to other, other players and coaches at the time and, and their experiences, uh, and but at the, at the end of the day, it 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 kind of comes back to, to the cosmos, right? Um, so I I don't want to give too much away. I feel like I'm kind of no, I get it. Uh, I'm not. I'm saying a lot without saying that much. I don't. Cause I don't want to give too much away. <laughs> but how would, uh, how would you? How would you? Uh, through, again, through your lens, uh, literally and figuratively, how how would you have described it? Maybe maybe memories from your from your from your father as well. How would you characterize the quality of play um, relative to where a lot of these quote unquote foreign players were coming from? Because there's a lot of debate as to whether, wow, this is just a, you know, retirement league or people just get an extra paycheck and that kind of stuff. But, you know, we're talking about, frankly, some of the best players in the world, regardless of where they were in their careers. Granted, the fields were not necessarily the best for playing soccer, but. The quality of play, I mean, you know, we're talking about some very, very, very talented players. It, yeah, I mean, that AstroTurf, wow. Uh, I, what, you know, one of the things that I noticed when I was watching tapes was the there was a difference in the quality of the games that were played on the grass and the quality and, and the AstroTurf. Um, so that, that was very interesting. But, uh, yeah, I think that the, I, I think that the players – enjoyed the expansiveness of the league. Remember we had the 35 yard line that was created to really open up the league. Uh, I mean, open up the, uh, you know, open up the offensive style of soccer because they felt they needed to appease the American sports fan and score more goals. And it was like six points for a win. So everything was about more, more, more. Um, some players didn't like the 35 yard line. Uh, but there were there were a lot that did and that enjoyed playing that more expansive style of soccer, which we don't see a ton of these days, um, as you know. So uh, that that was interesting. And of course, you had the shootout, uh, which was I wish they would bring that back. Don't you? The shootout. Well, that, that, that and frankly, I think even something a little, a little bit more uh, intriguing to me. And we talked about this with Clive Toy, I think, is the the unheralded points system, which frankly rewarded more goal scoring even if you were in a losing effort to at least get a couple of points for scoring some goals so that you didn't sit back and and park the bus as we say today exactly exactly i mean you got to love that so everything everything they did was just trying to promote goal scoring and attacking soccer and uh and and it was it was exciting what's the uh what's the most head-scratching thing that you kind of discovered in the process of making this film i what was it a uh, a team uh, name and logo or location? Uh, was there a, a story that kind of just stood out? Was it uh, something that kind of made you go, you just you were just incredulous that you couldn't sort of believe sort of happened, uh, anecdotally or otherwise? Gosh, yeah, there were, there were a couple. I think interviewing interviewing uh, Kyle Rote Jr. and sort of 
what he had to deal with by choosing soccer over football and uh, the Dallas Morning News newspaper kind of saying, oh, Kyle Rhodes going to play a communist sport because it was. Sure, in the and early a days, dad, it was a very, world, well, world yeah, famous, US yeah, and it, football player, right? Right, and in the early, especially in the early days of the league, it really was known. Soccer was a, known as a foreign sport, and a, and a lot of the press portrayed it that way. Uh, there were some, there were some good reporters, but there, as you know, there was a lot of negative, uh, not ne- negative stuff written about soccer at that time. So here's Kyle Rote Jr., who sort of is trying to become, um, you know, the, an American superstar, but yet he's, he's also having to deal with the backlash of, of playing the game. I mean, it was, it was crazy. So that, that, and, and I have that in the film. There were some really interesting quotes by him in the movie discussing that. So that was a little bit of a head scratcher. So I, I guess I'm really curious as to um, sort of what, I, I guess, what did you think you knew about this league going into all of this? Obviously, you had a little bit of a head start having it being part of the family, so to speak. And maybe maybe what did you kind of learn or, or, or were, were you surprised by anything after this process and after you'd done all your original research and stuff? Uh, did it go in a direction that maybe you didn't think was going to go? Well, there's always that. That's one of the challenging things and, and interesting things about making a documentary is that you 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 want to tell a story, um, but you're not always you're not always sure which way it's going to go. Right? You're you're not. Sometimes it 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 shifts directions, and you you just have to go with the flow. You don't know what people are are going to say, but no, I, I for the most part, I think the film kind of took took a the journey that that I hoped it would I mean you always learn things when you're making a film um but yeah I think I think it there, there was uh the legacy of the league I think was even maybe even more than I had thought it was which uh especially for that generation that were around at the time um, people that I talk to, fans, that sort of thing. Uh, but no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy with the journey the film took, and um, I hope the, 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 the audience likes it as well. All right, a couple more questions for, before we wrap up. I, I, like, give me a sense. So clearly this Major League Soccer thing, right, has uh, in certain cases, and frankly sometimes against, I think, the, uh, the central ownership uh, structure of the league, uh, has embraced uh, some of the old uh, team names, at least, and uh, tried and tried to uh, essentially uh, absorb some of that original history too, right? So the Sounders and the Whitecaps and the, the Timbers, uh, arguably the Earthquakes. Um, how do you feel about that? Given you, uh, as a kid, were part of this league. Your dad was part of this league. This film that you put together about the NASL. Uh, do you feel good or bad or indifferent about? that sort of, shall we say, appropriation, I guess, of that early history? Because we've heard differing opinions on that, both positive and negative. Yeah, I, I'm all for it. I mean, in Seattle, uh, the sound, and I think, again, people are, I, I can see both sides of this, to be honest, because the MLS, they want to do their own thing and they want to um, uh, set their own, uh, tone and their own legs. I, I understand all that, but I, I actually love it. And I know the Sounders uh, were huge in Seattle and you can pretty much talk to any soccer fan out there and they, they know the Sounders. So I think in cities like that, the fact that they're keeping, keeping the name uh, tells you a little bit about the impact that the league had, that the NESL had, and, and they want to continue continue um honoring that i i i don't have a problem with it uh but i i can also see i can see the flip side as well but um uh, you still have the rowdies although they're in the the usl league now i believe right the usl so um no nah, i mean i'm 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 all for it if they want to if they want to keep that name why not yeah i mean look i i think the, on the positive side you look at it you, there is um it forces people to actually know and remember or be forced to, to, to investigate the fact that there was 
a team of some sort in a league that predated MLS uh, and arguably makes people a bit more curious about what came before them. And, I, and I've always felt that and one of the reasons I did this film was I've, I've, I've always felt that the history of the NASL has been lost uh, to a certain extent. Um, and I hope that that when people watch this film, they will be like, wow, I, I had no idea that that this was happening and or that this happened and um, uh, that they will truly appreciate what these uh, pioneers, which they were, did for soccer in this country. And um, yeah, uh, so I love that they're keeping the Sounders and the Whitecaps. And like you said, it's, it, it does. It forces people to, to understand the NASL or want to understand the NASL a little bit more. All right. One last question, and I'll let you promote, okay? Um, did you uh, – and I, I'm sorry if this is maybe giving away something, but maybe it's, uh, maybe it's not. I don't know. Did you, did you get into the tan- – which is probably a tangent, I'm guessing, okay? Because I haven't seen the whole thing. Um, the indoor uh, – thing that the NASL kind of played with a little bit, but, um, you know, it was arguably more of a sideshow to the bigger thing, or did you kind of, kind of avoid that for, for fear of going down another rabbit hole or two? Well, it, 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 uh, we, we didn't get into indoor that much. We, we kind of tried it and it didn't really work because it did go off, uh, too much, um, on, on a tangent. So our primary focus for this film was was the outdoor league um, and uh, the beginnings of that and um, and ultimately the end of it. But yeah, that that really was our focus in this. But I think the indoor league really uh, the impact the indoor league came after the NESL folded and and really kind of kept soccer in the public eye here in the in this country through the major indoor soccer league or or as it was known missile at the time. So, um, but I think that's another film, the, those 10 years after the NASL folded, which was a, a pretty dark time uh, here. And um, it was hard. It was hard. And my dad, I remember those years very, very well. Um, and, but a lot of the guys, thankfully, that were part of the NASL stayed and continued to grow the game. Um, and there were other leagues that, that came up as well uh, that led to uh a lot of those players having a place to play and to develop and, and ultimately some of them go on to uh, the MLS. So, yeah, sorry. I know I kind of, I kind of went off on a tangent no, there, no, no. I mean, that. That's absolutely. That's, so that's true. And that's, that's really interesting to hear because the, the whole, there was that dark period. I think a lot of people, a lot of fans in particular, I can't imagine the players and the coaches and stuff that had signed up for this. I feel like they were kicked in the stomach, right? Because it just, it just all went away. So quickly now arguably the songs there right but and then it was nothing to pick up the pieces right right it was devastating and i remember it uh because i think i was 12 11 or 12 when it folded and it was a very sad time and there was a lot of kids in this country um whose dreams kind of went as well that that saw themselves perhaps playing for the cosmos one day or the strikers or or whatever but uh so it, it was a hard time but i but i will tell you what the NASL did for, for the growth of the game in this country, uh, for girls and boys, for, you know, for both. And, you know, Dick Cecil probably said it best, and uh, who was the vice president of the, of the Atlanta Chiefs. He said that the NASL created a youth movement in soccer that was unprecedented in any sport. So I, I feel that probably ultimately that, that's the legacy of the league. Yeah. And as somebody, as a kid who played in the, uh, in the seventies and early eighties and, uh, uh, was very much in, in, in that arena, I, I grew up in the Northern New Jersey area, which was lucky to have, uh, a pretty rich, uh, youth soccer culture, certainly not like in, in certain other parts of the country where it was just not, not even a, not even a, it was a non-starter. Right. But, um, but yeah, and living in the shadow of the cosmos. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. The NESL moved the game to, to out of the ethnic areas, out of the city, into the suburbs. I mean, listen, my dad's team, the, the New England team, and moved to Jacksonville, Florida, North Florida, right, where football, American football, was king, and kids there had never 
a lot of them had never touched the soccer ball before the the NASL team came in. And now it's it's turning into a, its own little hotbed of, of soccer. And um, so those sort of pockets of the United States, I think, really, really felt the influence of, of the NASL and still do. I mean, you could go back to Jacksonville now and and talk to a lot of uh you know, people that are now coaches there uh, that remember those years fondly and got involved in the game because of of the team end. I'm not sure they would treat you to a glass of iced tea, though, there. But uh, <laughs> I digress on that. I know, right? I, you know, it's Lipton, Lipton were a great sponsor. Oh, know? yeah, I think so. I agree. I, I, think, I think it's probably one of the best, uh, both the New England and the Jacksonville versions logos out there, I think, of the entire sort of run of the NASL. I, and I love, I fell in love with the logos and stuff. I was a kid. I used to write away to all the teams and have them send me media guides and stickers and all that kind of stuff. But that that schooner, that uh, that, that ship there, and the, and some of the uh, the ads that the, some of the players did uh, for, for Lipton Ice Tea yeah. were just, just – yeah. um, but, you know, those, those are some of the quirky things that um, that just made this league so – Unique, and it's also in the in the background, really, of the 1970s, right? As we've learned in this little silly show, we've we've, you know, this was, was probably the decade most packed in this country with challenger leagues, challenger sports, uh, sports entrepreneurialism, uh, you know, throwing lots of stuff against the wall. I mean, it was just a, and it's just it was just a, it was a trove of stuff, and the NASL was probably, you know, one of the biggest, whitest, hottest comets of that. Um, like a lot of the other things, it lasted a whole lot longer, frankly, than some other even more ballyhooed things like the ABA and the WFL, right? So, yeah, it is incredible. Yeah, it was very representative of of kind of what was going on uh, in the seventies. But to to think of of where soccer was before the NASL and before Pelé, and and then what happened, that explosion, um, it's, it's pretty incredible. It really is. And uh, it's a shame it couldn't have lasted. I, I think that things, it, it grew so fast. Uh, it was in many ways way ahead of its time, probably wasn't thought out uh, as methodically as, as it should have been. But uh, wow, what, a, what an impact on this country it had. So I hope you enjoy the movie when you see it. <laughs> All right, and okie dokie, thank you to Rachel, and the film uh, is called, once again, it's called Big Time Soccer, The Remarkable Rise and Fall of the NASL. Now, depending on when you're listening to this show, if you're listening when we drop this show, we're pretty near uh, the dropping of the show on Monday, October the 11th of 2021, uh, you are still in luck, and uh, in two days' time... On Wednesday, the 13th of October, uh, you can, if you're in the New York metropolitan area, you can uh, see the debut of this film at the Kicking and Screening Festival, um, the uh, 2021 version of such, uh, at the place called the Upper 90 in Astoria, Queens. Uh, It's at 7 p.m. local time. And again, kickingandscreening.com. And just search up the Big Time Soccer page. Uh, and you'll find out uh, not only that Rachel will be there, but uh, some other uh, NASL uh, luminaries, as well as um, where to get tickets and all that kind of stuff. Now, if you're listening to this episode after the 13th, uh, you will want to uh, know and stay tuned uh, to find out where and when it will be streaming. As uh, you heard Rachel allude to in not so many words, uh, it's coming soon, and we will certainly be the first uh, to let you know. Uh, you can also follow Rachel uh, on Twitter at Rachel underscore Violet. That's Rachel is uh, R-A-C-H-E-L underscore Violet, which is V-I-O-L-E-T-T at Rachel underscore Violet. Uh, so you can follow her and she'll be uh, tweeting out when and where uh, it will be available for streaming as well. Uh, while you wait for Big Time Soccer, that film... Uh, you can go to Amazon and see her uh, tremendous 2016 documentary about her dad, Dennis Violet, a, a United man. Uh, and uh, that is available for streaming. You could rent it or buy it. 
uh, there'll be a link to that uh, uh, to add Amazon to Amazon from our website at GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com. And uh, once the uh, streaming link for uh, Big Time Soccer is available, we'll also put there uh, that link there uh, uh, up on our website again at GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com. Just search up this episode number two hundred and thirty-four. And whatever the time and the availability of the links, they'll be there. Okay, how about that? Uh, but while you're there, you can also tool around and see all of our other 200 and, I don't know, 30 some odd other episodes. we got so many of them out there. A whole bunch on the NASL and soccer, but not just that, but lots of great sports and, and memories and conversations. And just it's just a treasure trope. And uh, we'll continue to put stuff up there uh, as long as the interwebs allows us to do it. Uh, you can stream them, you can share them, you can do whatever. Of course, the best way of, is to uh, subscribe to us or follow us on your favorite podcast player slash catcher. Uh, that's the easiest way. We uh, Your RSS feed, whatever it is, however you get the show, just get it for God's sakes. And uh, please continue to listen and hopefully enjoy. Uh, you can follow us on social media, of course, at Good Seats Still on Twitter. You can follow us on Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. And you can also follow us on, uh, let's say on Facebook, you can find us at Good Seats Still Available as well. What else? Uh, our email newsletter, you want to get that? By all means, please uh, just go back to our website, tool around, you'll find the link somewhere on there. Uh, just your name and your email address, that's all we need. We don't share it with anybody, just ourselves. And uh, boom, you're on the list. You'll get uh, updates uh, each and every weekend, uh, a little bit ahead of time, and to let you know what we're going to be talking about this uh, upcoming week. Uh, email, you can send us that too if you'd like. We're at hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. We love getting email from our listeners, especially if they're uh, compliments. We certainly like those. And by the way, when you're subscribing to us or following us on your uh, your favorite web player slash catcher slash whatever, make sure you try to give us a review somewhere if you can do it. Uh, we love the five-star stuff or the 10 out of 10s. Uh, a little commentary about why you like the show. You know, that really does help our algorithms out there. So um, that's probably the easiest and least expensive thing that you can do. Uh, short of, of course, buying a, a book or a movie through our links on our website and stuff. So please do that, too, if you really uh, enjoy the show and want others to uh, enjoy it similarly. And, uh, of course, enjoyment is uh, courtesy this week, as always, uh, because of the fine knob twiddling and editorial skills of our pal Jerry Payne. Jerry Payne Audio Excellence, thank you. Kind, sir, once again, for putting up with our nonsense and uh, coming out with a great sounding and smooth sounding show once again this week. All right. Our thanks to uh, Rachel. Our thanks to you. Uh, and uh, take care, everybody. We'll uh, hopefully see you next week. More great stuff lying ahead. Lots of great uh, conversations and debuts of stuff. Please, you will not want to miss uh, any upcoming episodes make sure you're subscribed to us and we love you for doing so take care everybody see you next week bye